Hello everyone and welcome back to Slightly Noisy Mexico and also welcome back to Working Wednesday. Firstly, just a bit of an apology. If you were expecting this video last week, I had an ear infection. I was deaf as a post, I couldn't hear a thing. Hence, we are here today. What is Working Wednesday? It's a series on my channel where I talk about anything related to working online and or becoming a digital nomad and traveling full time, as I've been doing for the last five years now. In the last two videos, I talked through 10 online teacher mistakes, i.e. mistakes that I made when I became an online teacher and ones that I continue to make. And today in this video we're talking through mistakes number 11 to 15. You know what I mean, it's the last one of this series. I hope you find it useful. So on that note, let's get going. Okay, mistake number 11 may seem like something trivial, but actually this is something that I'm probably asked the most questions about, and that is technology and logistics. Ooh, where do I start on this one? There is an expectation that as a teacher, we need to have like a headset and a separate webcam, not using the one on our laptop. And actually, if you are thinking of getting employed, becoming employed by one of those companies that teaches children in China, it's actually one of the prerequisites or one of the criteria that you have to meet in order to actually get the job with them. So keep that in mind if you are thinking of doing that. However, if you are in a position similar to me, maybe you're thinking of teaching adults using a platform like Italki, Verbling, Cambly, whatever, you might not want to have a headset, you might not need to have a separate webcam because your laptop camera may be fantastic. So what do I use? Seriously, headphones, earphones that came with my phone, and that's okay. I don't need to have a headset. They work perfectly fine. In terms of my laptop, I used to have a very, not very good laptop, and it really wasn't good enough in order to handle Skype calls. So what I did, and this is an important question that comes up as well, I actually used my phone for about the first two years, maybe, of teaching online. I wouldn't say that teaching on a phone should be your go-to way of communicating with students because, yeah, in my opinion, it doesn't seem professional. I used to have it on like a small tripod thing that I got in Japan, therefore it's stable. It's not like you're holding the phone in front of you, that would just be ridiculous. If you do kind of want to come across as slightly more professional and serious, I would advise investing in a decent laptop, one which you can use the camera on the laptop. And, you know, like I said, something like this is fine. Think about what your students do. Have I ever had a student in the last five years that has a headset like they're in a call center? Never, zero, zilch. So why would you do it? <laughs> so think about mirroring, you know, what are they doing? Do the same thing. Many of mine use like AirPods or they might have, they just fell on the floor, or they might have, you know, those big headphones. That's fine, but whatever works for you. Obviously it's completely up to you what you use. If you wanna use a headset and you feel comfortable with that, go for your life. It's no problem. But the mistake I made is thinking that you needed to do that, that that was an absolute obligation when it's just not the case. Mistake number 12, I haven't got enough fingers to do this anymore, is shut up. <laughs> By this, I mean STT, student talking time, and TTT, teacher talking time. This can be a bit of an issue, particularly if you are someone that is quite vocal about certain subjects, you like having conversation. You know, if you are doing a conversation lesson, you might be tempted to kind of take over and overpower the student. You have to remember that that student is there to speak, to get speaking practice. You're a native speaker, you can do that already. You need to be conscious of the fact that that's what they're there for and give them the time to really talk and explain things, think of ideas and come up with things. Even when you have like awkward silences. I've said before that teaching online can often be like going on 10 bad dates every day. And it can be like that, you know, with those awkward silences. Be patient and give the students some time to actually come up with something. And quite often you're surprised at actually they come up with something really insightful and intelligent that really adds to the conversation. I know it can be tempting to jump in and I'm not saying that you shouldn't talk for an entire lesson because that would just be ridiculous. TTT is equally an important part because you have to explain things, you have to suggest things, you have to correct errors, you have to guide the lesson and, and prompt the student at times. One exception with this might be if a student is running through a work presentation, for example, they've sent you a PowerPoint document and they just simply wanna talk through it. And they might specifically say, you know, can you just let me talk through it as I would in real life? And then you can give us some feedback at the end. That's great, you know, don't jump into them. Allow the student to kind of, what's the, what's the phrase? 
guide the way, that's it. Mistake number 13 is the dreaded subject of homework. This might be quite controversial because as a teacher, of course, you would give homework to students. That's what you do in a classroom, at school, whatever. But when it comes to teaching adults, advanced adults particularly, or ones that are already at a level in which they don't need to study grammar, they already have a near perfect level of grammar. Ask yourself the question, is homework necessary? Do they need to be doing exercises at that level? One other thing to think about as well is the fact that just because you're the teacher doesn't mean that you're the only driver of that student's learning. Equally, if not more, the student is responsible for taking the time in their own time to watch TV shows, to watch things on Netflix, to read articles. So don't just think that, you know, oh, it's just down to me to, to encourage the student's learning because it's also down to them. You know, you're not a magician, you're not a miracle worker. A huge piece of advice to consider when you are teaching particularly adults is around the fact that they're an adult. They have a life, they have commitments, they have a full-time job, they probably have children. I had a cat walking over a piano the other week. You know, things are happening in their lives and you know, in the past I've made the mistake of, you know, this is your homework, you know, talking to them like they're a child, you know. In all reality, they weren't gonna do it because they haven't got the time, you know. Obviously, with some of them, it's a good idea and they might specifically ask for homework and that's where the trial lesson comes in again. Have that conversation with them at the beginning, you know, what do you want? Is homework gonna be something that you're realistically gonna be doing and have the opportunity to do? As an alternative to homework, and this is something that I've done, I've set up an Instagram page where I post things every, well, three times a week with useful vocabulary, grammar, common errors, things like that. I've also just literally, yesterday, set up a new page on my website with quizzes. So I'm updating quizzes every now and again for students to go on whenever they have time to practice their grammar and vocabulary, things like that. So think out of the box when it comes to homework. You don't necessarily just have to send old style exercises of course, this is different if it's an earlier level student. Mistake number 14 is not understanding asynchronicity. That's a wonderful word, isn't it? What I mean by this is talking about business hours. So I've seen many comments on forums and other videos and things like that where teachers are talking about the fact that they have specific business hours, like nine to five. That might work for you. Obviously, as a teacher, you might have other commitments, just like your students. You've got maybe another job, you have children, in the evenings, you might not want to be disturbed. That might be your family time. Completely understandable. However, the reality is you're working in an asynchronous environment, i.e. you've got people in other time zones, maybe 12 hours ahead of you, who want answers, who may contact you at certain times of the day. I'm not saying that you should be awake at three o'clock in the morning responding to messages, because again, that's just ridiculous. But think about your flexibility and your willingness to be there for your students because that's what creates rapport and relationship and retention, student retention. If a student contacts you and you don't reply for 10 hours or the whole weekend because you're saying, I'm not available at the weekend, <laughs> then it's not gonna work. You're not gonna retain that student. So just have a think about you know your ability to respond. 24 hour Skype, that's what I do, but it might not work for you. The other point about business hours is thinking about your target market. So where are most of your students? For me, most of mine are in Russia. When I am living in Poland, Latvia, for example, I'm basically on the same time zone. It's like one hour difference. So pretty much I can work alongside them at the times they want lessons, i.e. in the evenings when they finish work. Right now, as I said at the beginning, I'm in Mexico. That's eight hours difference, eight hours behind Moscow. Meaning that I can't work in the evening as I used to in Europe because for them it would be the middle of the night the next day. So I work in the daytime from like nine o'clock in the morning until three o'clock in the afternoon. For them it's like five o'clock, ten o'clock between those hours in Moscow. That works, you know, if you are traveling full time you have to consider, you know, can I realistically go to Indonesia when all of my students are in Europe? because then you'll be working from like midnight until four o'clock in the morning. It's just something you kind of have to accept and it can limit your travel options, if you know what I mean. So I largely stay in Europe and Mexico because of that reason. We're on to the state number 15 and I've purposely left this one to the end because it's quite a positive one. I wanted to leave this on a positive note and hopefully help you with your confidence as a teacher because that's the most important thing, not only for a student, but also for you. Mistake number 15 is about thinking that a student disappearing is a reflection on you. 
Of course, sometimes it might be a reflection on you. You might just be terrible, <laughs> or it might be the case that you're just not a good match together. But the thing that I get asked a lot is, you know, this student was with me for a few weeks and then disappeared and never responded again, or you know, they canceled a package or they canceled a lesson or whatever, and then they came back six months later, then they did it again. You see where I'm going with this, right? Again, it kind of connects to the earlier point about the fact that students have a life and sometimes they might come to you for a specific reason. They might not have practiced English for a long time. They might do it for six weeks. They might think, okay, that's enough for now. I'm gonna have a break. And they might not communicate that to you, but that's fine. And then they might come back again in six months. Fantastic. That's just how it works. Not everyone is a long-term student. So you have to obviously aim to have long-term students and student retention, but that's not necessarily the case at all times. Some people prefer to come and go. It's not a reflection on you. So drop that thought process immediately. Don't take it as like a personal attack that you know someone has booked lessons for weeks and then all of a sudden, they've disappeared off the face of the planet. I wouldn't go asking them, you know, where are you? You know, being forceful in, you know, the fact that when you start lessons with me, you have to continue. It's up to them what they do, you know. Those students will be replaced by others. So don't take it to heart. Don't think that you're crap. Don't think that you're rubbish, because you're not. So thanks for watching this series of 15 online teacher mistakes. I hope it has been useful. What I'm gonna do next with this series is gonna be business related. So there may be videos about how to set up a website, but particularly the first one I'm gonna do is about pricing as an online teacher. I've done a video about this before, about three years ago, but that was a long time ago. And I wanna kind of do an update one with things that I've learned over the years. So thanks for watching. If you have any comments down below, share your experience down below. You can check out the end screens over there, which takes you to my online teaching playlist. and. The next video will be down there once I filmed it. All right, so thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe as well, and I'll see you soon. Catch you later.